The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Christ. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, He asked His disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? They said, Some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Christ. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You can all be seated. I want to start today by telling you part of the story of Joshua. I know it's not one of the readings, but as I was reading this passage from the Gospel today, I was thinking about the end of the book Joshua. For those of you who are in my Tuesday morning Great Stories of the Bible, Bible study, you know the story. We talked about it two or three weeks ago. It's an amazing story of what happens after the great events of the Exodus. Here's how it starts. The people of God, the people who were descended from Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, fell into slavery in Egypt and cried out to the Lord, and the Lord sent them the Deliverer, Moses, who after the plagues and after the Red Sea brought them the law. I don't remember exactly how many people it looked like in the Cecil B. DeMille version of the Exodus, but there were, by all accounts, about two million people wandering under the leadership of Moses. Moses had, at the beginning of his ministry, an organizational problem, and he learned from his father-in-law to put the people into groups, groups of families of ten, of fifty, of a hundred, and of a thousand. He was helped by his brother, Aaron, and his sister, Miriam, and above all, by faithful Joshua. At the very beginning of the story of the wandering in the desert, the people approach the promised land, and each tribe picks a person, 12 men for 12 tribes, to sneak into the promised land and see what sort of place it is. Ten of them come back and say, there's no way. Sure, there are lots of us, but that land is held by giants. They have fortified cities and strong armies. We cannot do it. But Joshua, Joshua and Caleb say, if the Lord gave it to us to do, we can do it. They don't go in. Instead, they wander the desert. They wander the desert for 40 years. A significant number in the Bible, but 40 years is long enough for those who refused to go in, to die off. Of the people that came out of Egypt, only two, Joshua and Caleb, go into the promised land. The others are born in the desert and eventually go into the kingdom. It was significant that at the death of Moses, he calls the people together and gives them what is perhaps the longest sermon in history, the book Deuteronomy, to teach them what it is they are to do and how they are to worship in the land that God gave them. And then when Moses dies, Joshua is raised up as a new Moses. In a very significant, symbolic way, as the people are crossing in close to the Jordan River, Joshua parts the river like Moses had parted the Red Sea so that the ark of God and the priests go by with dry feet. Joshua was their great general. 
He led the people in the encounter at Jericho that taught them to trust God, and He helped them to recover from the battle at Ai, which taught them what happens when they don't and how they have to recover their strength. Joshua was the one that gave them tribal lands. That's what happens mostly in his book. A place for the tribe of Benjamin, a place for Judah, a place for Ephraim. Each of them living in their own land. And then, as Joshua is about to die, like his mentor Moses, he gives them his great and final speech. You may not recognize much of it. You'll recognize his zinger of a final line, though. It occurs on coffee cups and picture frames and in cross stitches hanging maybe in your kitchen. Joshua gathers the elders to him and he says, God brought you out of Egypt into the land of promise. He tells them the story of Abraham and the conquest, the wandering under Moses and how God delivered them in the promised land and gave them victory. And then he says something like this. I know you guys really well. I know what you've been up to, even if you think I don't. Some of you have adopted the gods of the Canaanites. Some of you came into the land and saw what your neighbors were doing and started doing that as well. A little hedge in your spirituality. Some of you still have gods that you brought out of Egypt. Idols and statues that you did not take, that your parents handed down to you. And you still trust in them a little bit. And you try to worship the Lord. That still happens, doesn't it? I don't mean that you have statues at home of foreign gods, but sure, people in the church still look to their neighbors to figure out what is important, what is valued, what should be at the center of their life, and what they should spend their money on. People still have religious ideas that never came out of the Bible, or indeed through the church, but things they picked up from their parents, maybe unintentionally, maybe unconsciously, about what is good and true and holy and what God wants. That's why we have a parenting forum so that you can sit with friends in a safe way and talk about the messages you are trying to give your children to make sure that you are not passing on bad ideas about God, instead true ones. For Joshua, the choice was clear. They had to choose which one they would serve. Would they be, would they serve the gods of the Egyptians or the gods of the Canaanites, or the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Today's the day to pick, he said. Choose this day whom you will serve, he says at the end of the speech. The gods of the Egyptians, the gods of the Canaanites, or the God of Israel. As for me and my household, we will serve the Lord. Today is the day to pick. Today is the day to say. You see why that story comes to mind when we hear the story of Jesus in in the north near Caesarea Philippi. He has gone as far north in his native country as he could go without going into a different country altogether. He can see the great cosmopolitan, multiracial, multi-faith city that was Caesarea Philippi, even today famous for its shrines to the pagan gods. He sees all of their learning and all of their military might and all of their idolatry. And he says to himself, what about me? And he says to the people around him, his disciples, what do they say about me? Who do they think I am? And they tell him the rumors. Some people think you are Elijah, the one that comes before the Messiah to set things right. Some people think maybe one of the great prophets has risen from the dead. Are you Isaiah, they say? Maybe he's Jeremiah. Somebody come back. What about you? The sharp-edged question that goes to Peter. Who do you say that I am? Peter, quick as a wink, says, you are the Christ. You are the Messiah. You are the Son of the living God. They're questions that we answer too, don't we? At some point, we answer for ourselves who Jesus is. At some point, we answer for ourselves whom we will serve. 
For some of you, somebody brought you here as an infant. Somebody brought you here and made promises and gave answers that they hoped to train you to make on your own. The priest said, Do you believe in Jesus Christ? And the person on your behalf confessed Him as both Lord and Savior. And then you came later as a young adult to say to the bishop that you believed it, that indeed Christ was your Lord and Savior. And the bishop prayed that you be strengthened by the Holy Spirit. Some of you did that as an adult. Some of you as a young adult. Some of you later in life. Most of you did that before you were 18. In fact, that's normal. The Barner Group did a study of people who said they had made a decision for Jesus that made a difference in their daily life and then asked them when that happened. 94%, 94% of people who made a decision for Jesus that made a difference did so before the age of 18. Why do we put money into children's chapel and Sunday school and youth group and indeed beg you to make your children go sometimes? It's because that's when faith is first and best formed. People who make a decision often begin that decision as children. That was true of me. I grew up in a Christian house and I gave my life to Jesus not in an Episcopal church, in First Baptist Church in Montevallo, Alabama, a church maybe the size of one of our transepts when I was 11. It made a difference. Not the difference I thought it would make, but it makes a difference even now. Some of you did that, but we're a mainline church. We're an Episcopal church. We've done studies here, so I can tell you that like in every Episcopal church, those who have made a decision for Jesus have done so before 18 and somewhere around 16%. One out of six members have not. I don't mean visitors who are exploring Christianity. I don't mean people who are growing up and not old enough yet to express their own faith. I mean adults who think of themselves as a member are still wrestling with the question. That is appropriate for a short time. But among us, as among all Episcopalians, as among all mainline Christians, about one in six have been thinking about it for years. Some are stuck waiting for the question, hoping to put it off just a bit longer. There's an old joke, I think it was by Henny Youngman, who tells the story of a man walking down the street at night, and out of a dark alley, he sees the glint of the revolver and hears the voice say, your money or your life. The man waits until the robber gets impatient and says, well, which is it? And the man says, wait a second. Give me time. I'm thinking about it. That's us. It can be. Who is Christ to you? It can be a thing we think about without making a decision for decades. But there it is, the question before us. Who do you say that I am? Who do you choose this day to serve? There is a little danger, I think, perhaps, in thinking that the decision is made once for all. Not so great as never deciding, but something in us thinking that once we have made a decision once, we have nothing else to do. As though the work and life of a disciple is some sort of works righteousness or earning our way. The fact is, you and I are asked the question not once, but frequently, weekly, maybe even daily. Who do you say Jesus is? Whom do you choose to serve? It's not because God needs our answer over and over again. It's because we need a chance to start again. In the story of Caesarea Philippi, Peter gives the right answer and immediately gives a wrong answer and has to be brought back into faith. The people who talked to Joshua promised to follow the Lord, but soon they were back in idolatry and some new prophet asked them again to return. They needed a chance to commit themselves again 
and regularly. And so do I. And so do you. That's why we do things to prop up our path of discipleship. That's why God created the church. Why He gives the church these gifts that Paul talks about in Romans. Why God appoints, gives the Holy Spirit to some to become leaders and some to become teachers and some to become pastors, some to become caregivers and mercy givers. God gives us the church so that we can start again every time we come together. It is because we need to start again to commit ourselves again to service that we come to church regularly, if not weekly. It is because we want to commit ourselves to Christ again that we commit to reading a chapter of the Bible or attending a small group Bible study. It is why people learn to say the Lord's Prayer before they get out of bed or to think through their day for glimpses of grace before they sleep. It is why some will choose a book about the faith somewhere they want to learn to understand more. It's why people spend time in centering prayer or mindful meditation or in conversation with God to remember what the path of the disciple is like. And yes, it is why people bring their children to children's chapel and Sunday school and youth group because a decision has to be made over and over again. And so it falls to us today. What about you? How would you answer the question, who is Jesus to you? How would you answer the question, whom do you choose this day to serve? In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.